When it was released in 1967, few outside the band's immediate circle seemed to know what to make of the Velvet Underground and Nico's combative noise and provocative lyrics. Only a few years later, it would become a key building block for the punk movement. And now, after several generations of indie and alternative rockers working from its template, a record that was once famous for its terrible sales has become one of rock's most revered icons. Shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather With flash girl child in the dark Andy Warhol is the only credited producer on the album, despite doing little of the work expected of the position. He still had a deep influence on the album. He gave Lou Reed subjects to write about, like Edie Sedgwick, who inspired the song Femme Fatale. Cause everybody knows the thing, the thing she does to please. She's just a little tease. He also convinced the band to hire the German fashion model Nico as a singer. Nico was already well known in rock circles before Warhol connected her with the Velvets. She'd worked with Rolling Stones guitarist Brian Jones and Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page and recorded songs by Bob Dylan and Serge Gainsbourg. She'd also done some acting, appearing briefly in Federico Fellini's La Dolce Vida. And what cost to share the good to all tomorrow's parties. Most of the details of the recording were lost or forgotten. It may have been recorded partly in New York and partly in L.A., in anywhere between one and four days, for as much as $3,000. The original recordings were turned down by Columbia, Atlantic, and Elektra, before being picked up by traditionally jazz-oriented Verve Records. Even after they were signed, the label insisted on changes to make the album more commercial, including adding the single Sunday Morning. Sunday morning. The album's release was held up for an entire year, a delay often blamed on Warhol, who was serving as co-manager despite having never managed a band before. On top of problems tied to inexperience, the peel-away banana sticker he designed for the cover required a special machine to produce it. The label agreed to the delay because they thought Warhol's art could help sell the record. That artwork would go on to become one of the most famous album covers in rock history. It would also produce at least two lawsuits. The first came right after the album's release, over the unauthorized use of actor Eric Emerson on the back cover. And in 2012, after the cover art had spawned a profitable merch business for the Velvet Underground, the surviving band members sued Andy Warhol's foundation to limit third-party licensing. Run, 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 take the dragon too. Run, 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 James the dead for you. Hey, what to do? The album's unconventional sound wasn't helped by Verve's anemic marketing campaign. On top of that, its lyrical content led radio stations and record stores to ban the album, and music magazines refused advertising for it. When I put a spike into my vein, and I tell you things aren't quite the same. When I'm rushing on my run, and I feel just like Jesus' son. It only made it as high as 171 on the Billboard album chart. Since then, the Velvet Underground and Nico has been reissued a number of times, including as a six-disc super deluxe box set in 2012. When an acetate of the original recording sessions that were turned down by labels the first time around was discovered in a Manhattan flea market in 2002, it sold on eBay for over $25,000. The record that no one had wanted at the time turned out to be worth more than its weight in gold. <laughs> 